Uh, for those of you that have no idea who I am, my name is Pastor Bill. I'm the campus pastor here at Maranatha Chisago Lakes Campus. And uh, as Dennis has already said, it's just great to have you all here visiting with us. I have a brief message with you today. Um, before I even get into that, though, I, I do want to reiterate also that uh, last weekend, the men's weekend, was just outstanding. And uh, guys, it's hard for us to, you know, make the time, take the time. And uh, I'll tell you what, everybody that was at this thing was blessed. It, it was just awesome, absolutely an awesome weekend. So next year, we hope to be bringing 20 or 30 guys from, from the Chisago Lakes campus with us and, and just, just be together and uh, allow the Lord and, and Pastor Mike just to speak into our lives. So we're very excited about that. Um, obviously, I wasn't here last weekend, and Tasha led worship, but uh, Denise actually preached. And uh, again, it's just, it's just great to go away and know that you have people that can step up, that can step in, and, and not just fill a hole, but do a great job. And, and so, Denise, thank you so much for the great work. It was very cool. Um, it is online. It is on YouTube. If you go to the church website, you can uh, find it if you happen to miss it. Or if you want to share it with all your friends, feel free. Um, that would be great. It's just a good message. This morning, what I do want to talk about, though, and again, briefly, I know sometimes, especially on game day, especially everything that's going on with AP and his son, um, you know, it's hard for our minds sometimes to stay focused the closer it gets to the afternoon with football games and nice weather and stuff. I want to let you guys know uh, I'm going to keep it brief, second service here, because I don't want to lose you, because I loved the first service message. I really think it was cool. I just, I, I just think it's awesome. It's just a great word from, from the Lord, and uh, I'm excited about it. And so I don't want you to be done before I am, so stay with me. I promise you're going to get out of here early. Um, and you understand that my definition of early is a minute. That's early. So if you're out here at 11.59, I held true to my word, and you are early. Matthew chapter 5, I believe, is where I want you to turn to. Matthew chapter 5. And this is the part of the scriptures where uh, it, it, the, the Sermon on the Mount is kind of chapters 5 through 7. But there's this one piece that I really want to hit on to begin with. It's uh, Jesus is getting into the Beatitudes. And I want to read verses 1 through 12. And then I want to come back and look at it a little bit and pick it apart and spend a little bit of time in it. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, says this, One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble. For they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted. For doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So that's verses 1 through 12. I want to go back, and I, I just I, there's a couple points I want to make out of this. And then we're going to look at some scripture in Luke as well. But just quickly, uh, starting there in verse 1, it says this, One day as, uh, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. And then it says this, His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach. And now one thing I think it's important for us to remember is that this is real. It's, this is real life. And, and I, over and over again, I like to remind us of that fact. A lot of times, the picture we have is this. 
that this is what it looked like, that Jesus went up on the platform where there were stage lighting and a sound system and he had a stand and he had his Bible and his notes and another printout and all the people sat in comfortable chairs and there was heat on a cold day and air conditioning on a hot day and they were out of the sun and they were comfy and they were cozy and everything was perfect. And that's the picture I think that we like to have of this type of an interaction. And, and the pastor got before them and they all were seated and, and that's the way it was. But the reality is this, when we were in Israel, you actually went up and you sat on a mountainside or a hillside and you sat in the dirt or you sat on a rock and it was extremely hot and you were sweating and you had your water jug and, and, and there's a lot of different things that were going on at the same time. And the Bible says this, the Bible says that Jesus was there and his disciples gathered around him. And that word, his disciples, I want you to listen to this. A lot of times in, in my studies and my preparations, I'll read what's called a Jewish New Testament commentary. A Jewish New Testament commentary. And it gives you a good understanding from a language perspective, a cultural perspective, just some of the different things. And here's what it says about this. The first question I want to ask you this morning is, are you a disciple of Jesus? Before you answer, let's just talk about this a little bit. This is what this um, Jewish New Testament commentary says about discipling or about being a disciple. Uh, it refers to them as Talmudim, uh, disciples, the plural, Talmudim. It says the English word disciple, now listen to this, fails to convey the richness of the relationship between a rabbi and his Talmudim, his disciples, in the first century. It says this, teachers, both itinerant like Jesus and settled ones, attracted followers who wholeheartedly gave themselves over to their teachers. Not, not in a mindless way like a cult, um, but just wholeheartedly gave themselves over. And then it says this, the essence of the relationship was one of trust in every area of living. The essence of the relationship was one of trust in every area of living. And its goal was to make the, the disciple like the rabbi, like the teacher, in knowledge, in wisdom, and ethical behavior. The goal was to make the disciple like the teacher in knowledge, in wisdom, and in ethical behavior. To wholeheartedly give oneself over. Okay, so... I'm challenged by this. As I was preparing about, uh, with this midweek, I started thinking about the last two Sundays that I was here uh, before, before we went to the men's conference. 35 people made first-time commitments, first-time salvation commitments in those two Sundays, which is awesome, right? Praise God for that. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, did I do them a disservice? Here's what I mean. And this whole time, I want you to be thinking this. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Here's what I mean when I ask the question, did I do them a disservice? Because what I did is I stood here and, and I, I talked about giving your life to Christ. Surrendering to Him. Salvation. But as I think about it, I think, Grace, there's a whole bunch of this that I left out when I talked about this. The, the whole picture of being a follower of Jesus. And, and, I, and I can't help but wonder in the church today because we, we count, we keep track of our salvations. Just, it's just to have. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't like we get paid more or we get a, you know, dividends or something by, based on salvation. It's just something we track. So I wonder this as a pastor, as, as somebody that's up here, do we hesitate to tell the whole story because we, want, we don't want people to really stop and consider what they're doing. Again, here's what I mean. Pastor Mike made this statement last, last weekend. He said there's a difference between accepting Jesus as your Savior and accepting Jesus as your Lord and Master. There's a difference. Jesus, I accept you as my Savior, so what you did for me is awesome. But that's where this is going to stop. 
I'm not going to surrender my life to you. I believe, but I'm not going to give myself over to you. I'm not going to wholeheartedly surrender. See, when we become a disciple, when we say this, when we say Ike, that we're going to follow Jesus, we're saying, in every aspect of my life, I want to be a follower of yours. That's what it means to be a disciple. In, in all aspects, not just the ones that are comfy, not just the ones that fit, not just the ones that work for me, but if I'm going to say I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, I'm saying in every aspect of my life, yes, I want to follow you. Not just coming to church on Sundays. For some of us, it's next to impossible to come to church on Sundays, much yet do something for him on Mondays. To be a disciple, saying, Jesus, I will follow you. Come here a second. Imagine this. Jesus goes to Matthew, or we'll just call you Jonathan. Jesus goes to Jonathan, the tax collector, who's sitting at his booth. You guys have heard this scripture. Jesus goes to him. Now, Matthew Jonathan, he knows because he lives in that day, right? He's, you're 2,000 years old. Are you afraid I'm going to hit you? You're kind of wincing. I always do. My dogs do that too. No, I'm just kidding. They don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he knew exactly what Jesus meant when Jesus walked up to Matthew Jonathan and said, Follow me. He knew exactly what it was going to entail if he put down his books. If he put down his ledger, because he was a tax collector, if he closed the cash box, locked the safe, punched in the code, did all of this stuff, he knew what he was doing by putting that stuff down, standing up, and saying yes, because he lived in that time. For us, being a follower of Jesus means getting up on Sunday and going to church and only yelling at our kids a certain amount. That's what it means. That's what following Jesus means. Are you a disciple of Jesus as you sit here in church on Sunday morning in your comfy chair thinking about what you're going to do this afternoon? Are you a follower of Jesus? Or do you go to church? Because those are two very different things. Matthew Jonathan knew when Jesus says, follow me, he knew what it meant to stand up and say to a rabbi that was offering this, this is what they did. There were all these different teachers, these different rabbis that would reach out to people. Quite often, the most successful. They got the best grades. They were, they were good students. They were good kids. They're the ones that would get called by all these rabbis. Jesus calls the tax collector. And knowing exactly what he is committing to, Matthew Jonathan, he puts down his book, closes his laptop, puts his phone in his pocket, stands up, and says, yes, I will follow you. I will be your disciple. I want to model my life, Jesus, after yours. I want to humble myself and surrender my life to you. I want to be your disciple. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thanks. So now, as you sit in your comfy chair with the thermostat set just right so we're all good, maybe a little warm on this end of the room, are you a disciple of Jesus? Or are you a churchgoer? And friends, I'm very challenged by this. I'm very challenged by it. Because if you and I are churchgoers, then what's the message that we're passing down to our children? What does it mean to follow Christ? To go to church or to be a disciple? It's a challenging thought. The second thing I want to look at is this. This first line of these Beatitudes 
It says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for them. Now, some of you have an NIV, and I know the NIV, it says, and blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, first of all, you look up this. This is a simple little thing. And if you look at it, it says this in the commentary too. It means happy, fortunate, blessed, or blessed. Okay, so put this together because if it really, on the surface, Ike, this does not make any sense whatsoever. Because what it's saying is happy or fortunate, blessed are those that are broken. That doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. In our minds, what we think is blessed, happy, fortunate are those that got all their stuff together, right? That is our, our immediate response, our immediate reaction is, well, we look up to those that appear to have everything together and everything going for them. That's, that's who we look at, and that's our definition of, they're blessed, man. They're, they, man, they're, they're as lucky as it comes. They've got to be happy as can be. I, I mean, that's it. That's my definition of somebody that's blessed. The Bible says exactly the opposite, which, man, is that ever, it, it's always like that, isn't it? The Bible goes against what we naturally think so often. The Bible is saying right here is, Jeff, blessed are those that are broken in spirit. Blessed are those that recognize, that, that get to that point where there's humility, where they're humbled to that place of saying, God, I need you. It says, blessed are those that are poor in spirit. It, it, listen to, the, to the, the definition that this uh, commentary, uh, how it explains this. It says, when defining the poor in spirit, listen to this now. It says, those who have the humble, dependent, listen to this word, vulnerable attitude of poor people, even if they happen to be rich. Those who have a humble, dependent, vulnerable attitude like poor people, even if they're rich, inside, in our spirits, in our hearts, in our souls, having that attitude as we come before God. Now, like I said, with that in mind, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, or go there on your phones. You know, those of you that are techie, um, even if you have your phones or, or a device, you can still highlight things on there. And, and if that's going to be like your main means of devotions and stuff, highlight stuff. It's okay. Highlight it because that means that something stood out to you. So when you come back through and you read it again and you see it highlighted, man, that's a great reminder of something that's already been stirred. Luke chapter 18. And I, and I want to start in verse 9. And th this is a parable that Jesus is telling. Luke 18 verse 9 says this, Then Jesus told this story to some... Listen, listen who he's talking to now. Listen to this. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. He, that's what's so great about Jesus. Jesus is not taking this and tiptoeing around it. Jesus is taking this. He's identifying this. He knows, Keith, that you have a self-righteous attitude, that you have a heart of stone, and that you are filled with pride. So what's Jesus going to do? Jesus says, I'm going to tell Keith this parable. And he knows this. Phil, you have the same stinking attitude. Kevin, you too. All right, guys, here's the deal. This is the story I'm going to tell you. He doesn't tiptoe around afraid you're going to stop coming to his church. He tells it like it is. That's it. It's not like today where we're afraid. If we say something that offends you, you're just going to get mad and go to a different church. We're going to keep going and going like the Bible says until we find something that satisfies what our itching ears want to hear. Right? Anybody relate to that? Jesus says this, this parable, he says it right to those people that he knows have that self-righteous heart, that are built up with this spiritual pride. Jesus brings it and he says it right to them. Could you imagine if we did that today? Could you imagine, and I'm talking about with the right heart, 
Not a heart of, of meanness, not a heart that wants to beat down, but a heart that wants to bring healing, a heart that wants to lift up, a heart that wants to see people healed. Could you imagine if we just did that? Amen. Be crazy. Jesus goes on to say this, and again, He's saying it to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Jesus tells them this parable or this story. He says, there's two men. Two men went into the temple to pray. Sven and Oli. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. One was a Pharisee and one was a despised Tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. And you know the question I'm going to ask. Guys, listen to this. The question I'm going to ask is, which of these two people are you? The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. He said, I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat. I don't sin. And I don't commit adultery. And I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. All right, here's what we're going to do. I can't take it. We're just going to go down the list and we're going to say who's, who's, who is that. That's what we're going to do. We're just going to get real. We're going to call it on the carpet. And those of you that are that self-righteous, I know it. I'm just going to tell you. Can you imagine if that was the case? Can you imagine if we did that? That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying to these guys that he knows think that way. He, he says that. It's just, I, 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 it's unbelievable to me. Verse 13, he says this, But the tax collector, the despised tax collector, he stood at a distance, and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. What did that sound like when Jesus is telling this story? I, I was thinking about that. Is it like this? As Jesus is telling it to all these people around him and the, and, and the disciples are around, is it, does it sound like, is it filled with passion? Like, and the tax collector, he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his chest and he cried out to God, God, I have mercy on me, God, because I'm broken. Or was it like this? And the tax collector, the tax collector, he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. Instead, with his head bowed, he just said, Oh, God, have mercy on me, for I'm a sinner. What did Jesus sound like saying those words? And not just saying them, but saying them to these self-righteous people that are standing in front of them. God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. Imagine Jesus saying that to these self-righteous, arrogant people. He goes on to say this. Remember who he's talking to. He says, I tell you, this sinner, this despised tax collector who couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven... He says, I tell you that this sinner, not the Pharisee, not the one who's built up with all this spiritual arrogance and all of this self-righteousness, who does everything perfectly outwardly, who dresses so, who flows with the robes and all of this stuff. He says, this despised tax collector, this sinner, not this Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will will be exalted. You know, Proverbs is rich with Scripture that challenges the pride 
The pride going before the fall. The pride leading to mockery. And the humble being lifted up. The humble experiencing the grace. And friends, this morning, which one of those are you? I know this. Oftentimes, our focus is on, in a room like this, there are many that are here that are broken. And I know in a room, even a smaller crowd like this, I know that there are many here who feel exactly like that despised tax collector, just like Matthew Jonathan. There are many that feel it. But here's the other thing I know. The other thing I know is that in a room just like this, that there are many that are exactly the people that Jesus was talking to. That there are many that are built up with this spiritual arrogance, this spiritual pride where when we walk in the doors, we walk in and, and we're not wearing a robe, but we might as well be. And we don't have our shawls with our tassels on them, dragging on the floor for everyone to see, but we might as well be. And we walk around and we look and we look and thank God. Thank God that I'm not like Pastor Bill. Oh my goodness. Thank God I'm not like her. She's, she's divorced. Oh, God, what a mess she is. Thank God I'm not like that guy. I saw him at the bar last night. Never mind that I was sitting there with him, but boy, you should have seen him. Thank God that I'm not like Larry. And we walk in and, and, and we are filled with so much of this haughtiness, with so much of this arrogance, so much of this self-righteous mindset. And we don't hear a thing God says all morning long because we're just so glad that we're so much better than everybody else. Which one of those are you? I'm not asking which one somebody else is. See, that's, that's our struggle is we're so quick so I'm, that's Ike. Oh my goodness sakes. We're so quick to do that. Which one are you? Because here's what I know. I know that so many of us that have that, that haughty, hardened attitude, it's something that's been ingrained in us. It's something that we've been trained. I can't go to church and I, 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 I can't go to church and our parents have told us, man, you don't tell anybody that we argue at home. You don't tell anybody that you are smoking. You don't tell anybody that I smoke. You, you don't tell anybody this and this and this. From a young age, you've learned I can, I, nobody can know that I'm not perfect, least of all the church. And I tell you, I, I, Melanie and I have talked about this. I cannot grab hold of this mindset that there is something special about me because I'm a pastor, because I have that label. I just can't do it. I look at myself exactly the same as I used to. It's, I'm still just me. And if I'm ever not, Melanie helps me very quickly to remind me. Why do you all get weird when, I, when you talk to me? I, t I have probably more issues and problems than half of you do. I internally, I have insecurities that are very real. I have fears that are very real. My mind, gentlemen, my mind works just like yours does. I have to, with intentionality, control where my thoughts go. I'm no different. If there is anything inside of any of you that feels like, well, I'm going to see Pastor Bill. He can't see that I've been crying. He can't. He can't know that I'm struggling with my kids. He can't know this, this. Why? You see, because if I'm the wall that's standing between you and experiencing his mercy, 
then, then I'll be honest, I'd rather get back in a semi and drive truck. Because the last thing I want to do is stand between somebody experiencing God's grace. If, if you're the despised tax collector this morning, and your head is hanging like mine has many times, and it's like, oh God, I just, I hope no one looks in my eyes. Nobody better hug me because if they do, I'm going to break down. God have mercy on me. If you're that person or if you're this, you, you're just coming to this realization now that maybe God is just showing this, that you are this spiritual, arrogant person. That you're filled with this pride inside and the Lord is revealing that to you, then I'll tell you what, just allow yourself to be broken on the rock that is the love of Jesus. Allow yourself to fall on that and just be okay. It's really, it's fine. Experience His grace instead of be so hardened to think that you're so far beyond it. I, I want to close this morning and it's nice and early, so we have time. Now, here's the thing. I know that as soon as, as, soon as I pick this up and, and I'm going to do something, half of you, you just shut off. Okay, turn back on again. Because I believe this. You, you guys, it's a very true statement that, that our prayer is that people leave different than they were when they came in. This is that time right now when I believe that God can do something and you can leave different than you were when you walked in. Right now.